just have another engine. <laughs> I think that's just awesome. <laughs> I think it's awesome. All right, so here we are at Commercial Class Live. Review here of our systems. We will begin with the fuel system. Miss Ellie, tell me what in the heck we're talking about here with regard to a fuel system. There we go. Well put. <clears throat> That's kind of what it is. We call it a system. It's basically you got tanks, got to put gas somewhere, then you got to get that gas to your engine. How are we going to do it? Well, we got to have pipes. Okay, we got to have some tubing in there. Probably ought to have a pump just in case, you know, to be able to do it. We're going to suck this in through a carburetor. We're going to blast it in with a fuel injector. That's all going to be part of your fuel system. And we also have to think about not just, you know, where the supply is coming from, how it gets there. We always will have an engine-driven fuel pump. Uh, we have also auxiliary pumps that we have that, uh, that also can be turned on by the pilot uh, to apply extra boost in those systems. Sometimes uh, with altitude, fuel can, or uh, avgas can tend to vaporize a little bit. So sometimes you may get a, an enunciator come on that talk about your, your fuel flow or fuel pressure might be a little bit low. In those cases, you can switch on your uh, boost pump, the electric boost pump, in addition to the engine pump that you have. Just kind of fill those lines up a little bit better. It normally takes care of it, and then you can turn it off and just kind of see, monitor, and just see how it works uh, with things. That's one of the big things is why we are always monitoring our engines. We're always looking at all of the different parameters, not just our temperatures, not just you know the tack portion of things, but we're also looking at our fuel flow. Uh, is the rate what we're expecting here again? Is our fuel levels what we're expecting? Do we have the right, the right pressures? Do we see a fluctuation with anything? Normally fuel will be uh, filtered through a strainer uh, somewhere there as well. And uh, does that just to kind of keep any impurities out of the engine. Uh, and so that's a, that fuel strainer or the fuel filter in some cases. That'll be one of those things that on an inspection basis is is uh, replaced or cleaned uh, on those systems. Uh, in some cases, like with some fluids, um, if you have a pump and you just have air in the lines, one of the things that happens is, is if that pump doesn't work, it can't pull hard enough to actually pull the fuel in. And so in some cases, you actually have to manually add fuel to a line or the pipe in it to get the uptake for the pump. So it's what we call priming the pump. Once you have the, 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 the line filled with a fluid and that fluid goes into that impeller in the pump, then that pump can actually start sucking that fuel out and blowing it where it needs to go. So that's what we call about some cases having to prime that pump. Tanks, uh, as I mentioned, in the Diamond DA-40, we actually have six tanks, three in the left, three in the right wings. <coughs> Uh, they're all gravity fed down to the lower tank and from that lower tank there's uh, the, the, the pumps will help move that fuel to the engine. Uh, you have a left or right fuel selector valve. We want to make sure that we keep the fuel balanced properly. So every 30 minutes in the diamond we have an enunciator that will pop up on your primary flight display that will say switch tanks. And we do that as a reminder to not just switch the tanks in the fuel, but also fill the tanks, your own tanks, which by that we mean take a drink of water, get a drink of water, and then put the pulse ox on your finger. Let's check the tanks. How are we doing? You getting enough O2? And if not, we pull the tubing out, you get some, get some O2. That's the way it's supposed to work. Supposed to work. So, <clears throat> um, one of the things that we talk about, it's just like, okay, we're switching tanks, we turn the, the boost pump on first, First of all, before we switch tanks, one of the things is that we do, before we switch tanks, we put our hand on the actual uh, uh, fuel selector valve. We look, do we have positive fuel flow? We flip on the boost pump so that we have fuel, though, so that we can start pumping the, the, the fuel to make sure that we just have that little extra margin of safety that gas is gonna be going into that line. With our hand on the knob, we switch it over to the next tank. We don't take our hand off the knob, why? What would go wrong? Okay. Right. 
It's just like the same reason that we don't take our hand off the flap switch until we know that our flaps have deployed symmetrically. We keep our hand on that fuel switch. Because again, if I, turn, if I turn the boost pump on, I switch it over, and all of a sudden I notice now that my pressure drops and I hear <coughs> <coughs> on the engine. What am I going to do? <laughs> That's it. <clears throat> it's just like if you have a problem on the airplane. What was the last thing I did? Well, undo it. You know, it's like that. That's why we keep our hand on there and we watch and we monitor and we make sure that we're getting good fuel flow, good pressure before we remove our hand from the fuel selector valve and turn off the, the fuel boost pump. <clears throat> fuel gauges. Um, in the old days, the old float type needle system things in the tanks were just, you, they were, you really could not rely on them at all. And so what you used to have to do is you used to have to have a stick that had the gallons kind of marked in it, and you would get these from a manufacturer. And you'd have the gallons marked in it, you'd dip the stick into the tank, and then pull it back out and see where your fuel level is. That's how you knew where your fuel level is. We still do that to a certain degree, but the digital fuel monitoring systems that we have on our airplanes with the G1000 stuff, they're pretty doggone accurate. They really are. So those are the things that you can learn to rely on but initially, you never take that for granted. It's why you always monitor the fuel consumption on your flight, and you as the student should go back afterwards and ask your flight instructor, how many gallons did Atlantic Aviation, thank you Atlantic Aviation, how many gallons did they put back in the tanks? So you can look and you can say, okay, I flew this airplane for 1.4 hours predictably, I should have used this much fuel, how much did I really use? And that's kind of what you want to know because at some point, you're going to be out there flying cross country, doing all this stuff, and you want to make sure that you have planned your fuel properly. So that's why we always keep track of that fuel burn, so that we know. In most cases, my experience with the G1000s, and I'm still learning mine over here as well, but so far, I haven't been more than two tenths of a gallon off on what I have predicted that we have used and what we have actually used. So wood somewhere okay <clears throat> fueling one of the things that you'll see is that um, we we whether we get fuel from a truck uh, and someone else does it we always want to monitor to make sure that they've put the right type of fuel in our our airplane to make sure they've put enough fuel in our airplane make sure that they have grounded our airplane when you ground an airplane when you're refueling it what are we doing there what's what's what does the grounding piece do for us Why? Because fuel is a flammable substance and you're typically dealing with a lot. In my experience, I'm dealing with like a lot of heat and things, and so then <coughs> the ground is to minimize the flow of electrical static. That's what we're doing. We're taking the static electricity away from that aircraft. That's what you do when you ground it. You know how like, uh, you know, when you were a kid and it was always fun at uh, Thanksgiving just to kind of rub your socks, you know, across the carpet and walk over there and shock weird Uncle Harold, you know, with stuff like that? Same thing happens to your airplane. As you throw that airplane through the air mass, the friction around that airplane creates static electricity, which can exist around that, that aircraft. When they first go out and connect that little alligator clip that's on that, that, that cable, they put it to a piece of metal on the airplane so that it can de-static the aircraft. And they do that so that when they, they go to the metal fill nozzle on the tanks and they put the metal fuel nozzle in the tank, we don't get a spark because that would be entertaining. <clears throat> Not really. It would be tragic. So that would be kind of the, the thing. And so that's why we always ground it. When you go out and you're refueling on your own, well, my fuel stop in Lawton, Oklahoma, there's nobody who runs out to my airplane and says, oh, may I put gas in your airplane? Yeah, you, we've got to do it ourselves. It will not dispense the fuel until the system detects that you have pulled that cable out from the bottom of that system and connected it to one of the pieces of metal on your airplane. It won't, it won't, fuel won't flow until you do that first. And they do that as a safety precaution. So. That's why the grounding is important. 
fuel grades. You can look at all these fuel grades, know them for the test, and forget them. Because really the only one that we have out there now for, for, for airplanes is 100 low lead. I have not seen multiple fuel grades available for decades. But back in the day when I was flying, you could, you could choose. So uh, that was, uh, that's kind of one of the things there that you can uh, look at because you, you will be tested on that. What color is, uh, what color is Jet A? Kind of a straw colored, yeah, kind of a yellowish, clear yellowish kind of a thing. Okay, we do our fuel checks, we do our fuel sumps before we go. They're always at the lowest spot on the airplane. When we do this, what are we looking for? Looking for water or acidity. Yeah. Correct. Keep sumping that until you get, get the right sample. In humid environments, one of the things that, that I have seen is that if you don't top off your tanks after a flight, you can develop a lot of condensation inside the tops of those tanks between the top of your fuel level and then that air between the, the top of your fuel and the top of your tanks so, the, you know, so that, that moisture can condense inside that. You kind of shake the airplane around a little bit to slosh that fuel, let it sit there for a little bit, then you do your fuel strain, and then that's, that's it because uh, water weighs 8.34 pounds per gallon, fuel weighs six pounds per gallon. So the, the more dense water is gonna settle in the bottom, pull the, the sump out, or do a sump of uh, fuel, look at your fuel uh, strainer, not strainer device, your fuel sampler, whatever you call it. And you look for that water on the top and you keep dumping that out until you get to fuel. Also, sediment, things like that, and older air, uh, older engines that can, uh, older aircraft can be a thing. And so you keep doing it until you get a clean sample until you're happy. You're also checking the color. Avgas is what color? Uh, 100 low lead, I should say. When you're doing your fuel sump, it's a light blue. Always take that up. You've got something white on that airplane, right? Hold that up and just kind of compare it against a white background. Make sure that you're seeing that it's blue. <clears throat> Never assume. We had a good friend of ours who had a, uh, who's got a, uh, an Aero Commander, twin engine turboprop aircraft. Salem Abraham, Salem, love you buddy. He called for fuel. 144 Hotel Lima. They went to fuel his airplane. They thought they were fueling 141 Hotel Lima. They filled his airplane full of Avgas. He burns kerosene. Thank God he checked before he launched. So they had to, uh, they had to drain his tanks, get him all squared away. <clears throat> so never assume it's why we check that fuel before each and every flight. We check our oil, we check our fuel, we do a weight and balance calculation. We do it by the book. Electrical system. Why in heaven's name do we need an electrical system on an airplane, Ellie? <coughs> Modern aircraft especially need all sorts of different instruments. Um, power, um, We're bouncing a lot of electrons in these airplanes, aren't we? We got to get that electricity from somewhere. Where do we get it? From the battery, right? Okay. We do have a main battery. We have backup batteries. Okay. So the engine's not running. The main battery, as you can recall, its primary mission is for what? Starting. Starting the aircraft. Once that airplane is starting, started, it is designed to operate independently of the other electrical systems on that airplane. So if all of the other electrical system fails, that engine is going to keep spinny thingy-ing, okay? Once that airplane is started, another little device that is also connected to that engine is called an alternator, an alternator or a generator. What does an alternator do for us? <coughs> um, it produces an electric current. 
okay? It basically produces the electricity that will power what we need to have powered in flight. That electricity flows back from the buses, the electrical buses, that are all kind of governing the use of the electricity, the amperage that we have through the system. And then it, the pass-through flows through your main battery. And the purpose of that is to keep that battery charged. So that's kind of what that, that whole system is about. Electricity is generated through the alternator. It flows through all of the systems of your aircraft. And then there's a bypass piece that also flows that electricity through your battery. If, for whatever reason, that alternator or generator has a problem and it stops sending that energy to your systems, first of all, you're going to get a notification on your, your, your primary flight display that your alternator has failed. But you want to look and make sure that, that it, the voltage from the batteries has picked up that load and is sending now that electricity back to the systems. Once that happens, you're on the clock. Your AFM or your POH will tell you about how much you can expect uh, if you're running somewhere in the neighborhood of 16 amps on this system, about how long you can expect that battery to power those instruments. If the book tells you an hour, expect 30 minutes. If the book tells you 45 minutes, expect 22. Cut it in half. Whatever the book tells you, cut it in half. You need to get that airplane on the ground. Even if it's a 45 minute battery reserve, there are things that you can do to start limiting some of that. For instance, we can start turning off some of the unnecessary equipment that we have in that airplane that we don't absolutely have to have. So we can start conserving those electrons to get us on the ground. It is almost impossible for me to imagine a situation where in an aircraft flying below 24,000 feet cannot get an airplane on the ground somewhere where help is available in 22 minutes. That's still a long time. 30 minutes, that's even longer. We want to be conservative about those calculations, but that's kind of what it is. Then, if that battery goes out, most aircraft have a standby battery that you can also tap into if you need to for just that additional extra time it takes to get that airplane on the ground. Now, the one thing to note about some of those standby batteries, some of those standby batteries are designed to be very, very lightweight. Well, by doing so, they're not rechargeable. So they're kind of a one-time use only battery. So you don't want to be thinking about your checkbook, you know, when you're up there trying to get that airplane on the ground. But just know that you tap into that standby battery sometimes and that's kind of a, a one-time use deal and then that battery has to be replaced. Not all of them are like that, but some of them are. So you kind of have to know. So as we look here at the imagery here on kind of this typical circuit system that you have, you've got the battery here. The battery is the thing that is accessed here with these cold cranking amps to start the system. The electrical systems in aircraft come in a couple of different flavors. You've got a 24 volt system or you have 12 volt systems. Now, it's a, tw it's a 24 volt battery and it's a 12 volt battery, but the system itself is called a 28 volt system or a 14 volt system. So you have that little extra margin so that your alternator is producing 28 volts okay, uh, as it goes through the system more than is necessary and that's what you want more that's necessary to power everything on your airplane and still keep your battery charged so the 24 volt system will use a 24 28 good lord 28 volt system will use a 24 volt battery 14 volt system will use a 12 volt battery that's kind of how it uses so that you have extra energy producing capacity, but you're not going to use it all, hopefully. That's kind of the way that, that that works. But that's what you have to have to keep those batteries charged. 24 volt battery system, 28 volt, good Lord Almighty, 24 volt battery, 28 volt system. <laughs> so that's kind of that, that, that production and that, that dictates 
the type of wiring that your airplane has, and you kind of think of it as kind of a plumbing example here. And then the amps are kind of the current running in that system. So you're going to have the, 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 you know, your 28 volt system through here, and that's kind of the, the capacity. But the current flowing through there is going to be uh, measured in amperage, so amp meters. So in that, you're typically drawing, in most aircraft, around 16 amps on the system with that. And mostly with that, that's about half the capacity of what you have there for those batteries. So that's, again, kind of the way that that, that works. Battery starts the engine, gets the engine running. Now you've got your alternator now producing the electricity. Your primary bus, avionics bus, this is the way that, they've, that they have these things set up. You normally have a switch so that you can basically, like on the diamonds, you can actually flip a switch and go to something called the essential bus. So in the event that you have an alternator failure and you need to start limiting the amps being drawn on your system, in other words, start shutting off the things that you don't have to have, the diamonds have a switch that you can go to your essential bus. The essential bus is going to give you a radio, a navigation source, keep your displays on, and allow you to get that airplane safely to the ground. And again, by the book, it's an hour. So, Ellie, what questions do you have here on this electrical system? Okay. Alternator, you can see what happens here, the advantages of an alternator, da, 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 voltage regulator, over voltage, the ammeters, all of this stuff. You can look at all of this here, Ellie. All of this is just going to be, you know, repeating here for you. Um, some of these things will have, you know, kind of that, the, the older styled ammeters uh, that are on some of the older airplanes will basically show, is it charging, is it discharging? So in other words, are you getting a charge to the battery right now, or is it a discharge? If you see it's a discharge on the battery, you know that your electrical source has failed. So now you're discharging the battery. You've got a negative charge on there. So now you know you need to be looking for a place to get this airplane down and land it, you know, because you're just pulling off your main battery. Master switches are broken up into the battery and the alternator switches. Uh, clicking them both on is what's called turning on the, the, the master. We normally, to start the aircraft itself, we will only use the battery switch to start the airplane. And then once we have the airplane started, we've checked our oil pressure, we've got it idling the way that we want. Before we start turning everything else on, then we'll turn on our alternator switch. Because you want to kind of look and check the general health of your battery. Is my battery doing what it's supposed to be doing? Yes, it is. It started the airplane. It's charging stuff as it needs to right here. Great. Now I'll turn on my alternator so that it'll take the load over from the battery, keep all of my systems running, and then you'll, you'll start looking at your ammeters to make sure that it's charging your battery while powering your other systems. If there's an issue on there, it'll show up as an enunciator on your enunciator panel on your primary flight display, and then you'll know that you may have an issue that you need to get checked out before you launch. Circuit breakers, you know where your circuit breakers are, you know all of that stuff. You also know you only reset a circuit breaker how many times? Um, once. Correct. Why? Yeah. Why do you only reset a circuit breaker one time? Circuit breaker pop for a reason, okay? And the only time that you would reset it, Ellie, is if you don't smell smoke. If you smell smoke, you don't reset it, okay? You do not reset that circuit breaker. You get that bad boy on the ground, okay? There are NTSB reports where they could actually get them, where they tried to reset a circuit breaker multiple times to try to get the thing to go and all they did was light the fire. So that's kind of bad. Uh, when you look at the ignition switch here, and this is figure 9-10 on these things, 
you kind of have these, these switches, sort of these buffers between switches and the actual appliance itself, where it can kind of govern the power going to something here. The solenoid is kind of the activation piece uh, to kind of get the starter motor to go. And that's just kind of on your, your relay here with your starter switch. Uh, external power sockets um, and ground servicing receptacles. All of our airplanes have the three prong 28 volt system ground power units that we can use. So for instance, if you want to go out there on one of the diamonds and on the right side of the engine cowling, you pop that little door that we always check and make sure that there's no critters that have built your little house in there and you see a vertical stack of these three prongs. We have a ground power unit that you can plug into that turn the, turn the, the uh, battery side on on your, your uh, master switch, uh, I'm sorry, plug in the unit, turn it on to 28 volt, then turn on the battery side of your master switch, and then you can actually power up your avionics without pulling from the battery, so that at some point if you want to go out to the actual airplane and play with the knobology of the G1000, we can do it. That's why we have that ground power unit out there. Uh, inside the airplane also, one of the interesting notes is that we have these you know, back in the day, we would call them cigarette lighters. Well, they're like 12 volt adapter things that we have, you know, to kind of power things like iPads, things like that. <clears throat> Normally, if you have those installed in an airplane, you have an on off switch that will actually power those. In my airplane, I have one up front and I have one for the passengers. So part of my checklist is to make sure that before launch, that's off. Because again, I don't want any extraneous stuff happening here, any additional load on my engine, any d additional load on, on the system when I'm taking off or landing. Because when are the most critical phases of flight? Thank you. Uh, electrical malfunctions, you can look at this. It's all pretty standard. Vacuum system, even on the airplanes, uh, even with the G1000 stuff, some cases there are still vacuum systems. Most of those are electrically driven now with those pumps. But uh, with those, keeps the gyros spinning by blowing across the little veins on the sides of those inertial discs that we have. Uh, they call them gyroscope buckets. Nice. So the vacuum pumps are typically driven by the engine itself. Uh, another thing to just kind of note is that remember that any time that you connect something to your engine or you want the actual spinning of that crankshaft and then at the front of your engine you have a big flywheel that's spinning on that and then you can connect all this stuff to that spinning flywheel to like run your your generator to run your vacuum pump to run whatever it's going to be in some cases you have an engine driven uh, supercharger which is kind of like a turbocharger but it uses engine power as opposed to external power know that it robs your engine of performance with this thing I'm considering on my airplane, I'm considering a, an electrical de-ice system for my airplane. There's a company out there that is getting ready to, to start this year making a de-ice system that on the leading edges of my, of my, my airplane, so the, the wings, the struts, the uh, tailplane, to put an electrically heated leading edge on there. There's a separate alternator that gets bolted to my engine. So it's actually going to use some of that engine power to run this separate 18 volt generator just to heat these things when I need them. So I have to remember that when I turn that on, I'm also losing power in my airplane. Just like in your guys' Mustang, when you turn on your anti-ice systems in that, you're pulling that power from your engines. So you're losing some engine performance to power that DI system. And you always have to take that into consideration whenever you power those systems up. So, <clears throat> God, Ellie, the, the knowledge that you're getting in this class, my God in heaven. Um, so as we look at these things, we think about some of these uh, engine driven systems, in this case we're looking at vacuum pumps, uh, some of these things with the static systems, there's your, your, your pitot heat picture there, but then you also see this thing, this little stick figure drawing of an airplane, and I can remember some of these old airplanes and it looked like they had this, this horn mounted on the side of it and I thought, 
Why do they have like an air horn mounted on the side of that airplane? What the heck is that? Maybe that's just to scare the cattle before they land, you know? Is that kind of one of those things? Yeah, well, stupid me. It's actually, uh, you know, kind of a wind-generated vortex generator to power all your vacuum systems. So that's kind of what those, those things are, so. And there we go. Flight instruments. All right, flight instruments, Ellie. Yeah. We have three main category, uh, categories of flight instruments that we are going to be talking about. What are the three main buckets? Pressure instruments, okay. gyroscopic instruments, and magnetic. Pressure, gyroscopic, and magnetic. By pressure, we refer to those as pitot-static instruments. Then we have our gyroscopic instruments, and then we have our magnetic instruments. So we start with the pitot-static. With the pitot-static instruments, pitot being the first word, what three instruments are part of the pitot-static system? Airspeed. Airspeed indicator, thank you for saying that first. Altimeter. Altimeter. VSI, vertical speed indicator, that is correct. So remember, the three pitot-static instruments are in order, airspeed indicator, because pitot matches with airspeed, altimeter, vertical speed indicator. Okay, so those are the three. Gyroscopic, the three gyroscopic instruments are what? The first one is going to be the most important one. It's an artificial horizon, but we call it something else. Um, no, that's, that's one of them, but that's not the one I'm after. Attitude. attitude indicator, correct. Attitude indicator. Of all of the instruments, the alpha and the omega is the attitude indicator. Okay, so the very first gyroscopic instrument is the attitude indicator. Then we look at the turn coordinator. Well, actually the next one is really the heading indicator heading indicator, and then the turn coordinator. Kind of in order of importance, I guess. It just really kind of depends on what's failed. Then on the magnetic side of the house, what do we got? Got a wet compass, okay? <laughs> so that's what we got. Okay, the thing that we think about pressure, we have a couple different kinds of pressure. We have static pressure, we have dynamic pressure. Right now, if I hold my hand right here, what type of pressure is being exerted on my hand? Static. static pressure. Nothing moving. It's just what static stuff is happening around my hand right now. That's just static pressure. However, if we took my hand and we put my hand in an automobile, let's say, and we started driving down the road, and I take my hand and I put it outside the window so that I can, I just love the feel of the air through my hair, you know, through this. So with this, I put my hand there and I start feeling pressure. I start feeling something moving my hand backwards. What kind of pressure is that? Dynamic. That would be dynamic pressure. Static ain't moving. Dynamic is. So that's kind of the things that we have to, to think about because we use both of those elements in how these instruments work. The total measure of the total pressure uses both static and dynamic. That's how we wind up with total pressure. Once we start getting into the commercial side of this stuff, we're going to start looking at partial pressures. We're going to start looking at some other things here. We're going to get Guy Lussac involved. We're going to get Boyle involved. Oh, my Lord in heaven. It's going to be like a science class. Okay? So, uh, the pitot-static system, and again, we've talked about that, how it all works. You have seen on the sides of aeroplanes these little static vents that are back there. Most of the static vents are normally about three-quarters of the way back along the fuselage of most aircraft. That's where you'll find them. On the diamond, where do you find it? I will tell you that it's not on the fuselage. Remember on the diamond, it's not a pitot tube, it's a pitot blade. 
the leading edge of that pitot blade has a hole in it. That's the pitot inlet. Okay? On the back of that pitot blade is another hole. That is your static source. My gift to you. Okay? Pitot tubes. Are they susceptible to like freezing over or getting clogged or stuff like that? Yeah, you put a cover on it. Let's say that you fly through some form of visible moisture and it's cold. How do they get hot? You got yourself a little switch in that airplane, don't you? Pito heat. My gift to you. You can turn on a switch called pitot heat that is going to warm that, that, that pitot tube so that when you're flying through a cloud in icing conditions, it will not clog. So the ice won't clog your pitot tube. Conversely, talking about what we just talked about, when you turn on that pitot tube, you're drawing more amps, right? And in this case, it's drawing quite a few amps. So you got to kind of watch and make sure that your system is going to be able to handle everything because it's one of the things that you don't want to get into a cloud to determine that, oh, wait a minute, my pitot heat doesn't work. You turn your pitot heat on before you fly through any visible moisture, any visible moisture. You turn that pitot tube heat on. In fact, the G1000 will send a note to you that that your pitot heat is off if the temperature is below 7 degrees Celsius. Okay? So, the pitot static system is a system that is open to the atmospheric pressure around that airplane. These little openings around there basically take that static pressure, which you see here on the static vents on the side, which do not get impact air pressure like this, like dynamic pressure. But the pitot tube does rely on dynamic pressure, right? So what you have to do to operate your airspeed indicator is you've got to have something in there that measures the difference between the dynamic pressure going through that hole, that ram air, if you will, the measure about the molecules, because we know it's all about the, Molecule. thank you, measured against the static part of it in the back. So that's kind of how that airspeed indicator works. It has to get not just the ram air, but it also relies on the static pressure. That's how that measurement occurs through there. So both are, both are critical when it comes to the operation of that system for the airspeed indicator. <clears throat> so, just as this is talking about here right now, this is kind of how it works. Now, let's say, for instance, that those static vents on the back of the airplane or on the back of the pitot blade become clogged. Well, that seems like that could be the beginning of a bad day, doesn't it? <clears throat> so, what do we have in that airplane that we can use in the event of some other form of static blockage? Oh look, you have an alternate static source. How handy. So, <clears throat> you can turn a switch inside your airplane that uses the static pressure in the cockpit to measure against those instruments, to keep those instruments working. Now, is it the same pressure as outside? No, it's a little different. Most of your AFMs or your POHs will have a little guide saying, if for whatever reason you use your alternate static source, here's what you can expect to have from an error standpoint with regard to your altimeter, vertical speed, and your airspeed indicator. And they will have some guide to say, here's what you can say. What's nice about this is, is that in most cases, the biggie is going to be your altimeter, because you don't want to hit nothing. DHN, don't hit nothing. That's the rule of instrument flight. So it normally will read that you're actually higher than indicated. 
which gives you a little margin of safety, normally, is what it'll say in there. The difference is going to be on your, uh, your airspeed indicator, because your airspeed indicator, you actually may be flying a little slower mm -hmm. than your airspeed may indicate. So you have to look at those books inside your airplane to understand that, because that kind of comes into play whenever you're trying to land the airplane. <clears throat> like if you were concerned about it. It's actually not a percentage. What they do is, is that they'll show you. They'll say, okay, here's your indication. Your indication is 60. Here's your actual. Okay. Yeah, here's your, your indication is 90. Here's your actual. It's not a percentage. It's kind of, it's a little different. At least it is in mine uh, with that. But it's not off too much. Mm -hmm. But it is off a little bit. Mm -hmm. But close enough for jazz. <clears throat> so. Just remember, you have that alternate static source that you can use inside your aeroplane if you need to. Here's another question for you. Okay, let's say that you flip that alternate static source switch right there. Let's say you flip that and you still got nothing. Something is still wrong. What could you do? What could you do? Do you remember this? <laughs> you break the face of your vertical speed indicator. Oh. You break the glass. Why would you do that? To, to access static pressure. Because if it's all clogged, you have a closed system. In order to open the system again, you got to do something to open up that system to the, to the static pressure somewhere. By breaking the face of that vertical speed indicator, it opens up the system again to at least inside your cockpit. So now you have an open static source. And the reason that you break the glass on the vertical speed indicator is because it's the least expensive instrument to replace. There you go. All of this is old wisdom from old instructors. Well, they weren't old at the time. I'm sure they are now. Okay. So here again, airspeed indicator, as we talked about, the measurement here has to do between the dynamic pressure coming in through that pitot tube against the static vent pressure through this. As that compresses, it turns the hand clockwise. More pressure, bigger number. Less pressure, smaller number. That's kind of how that sucker works. <clears throat> Color coding on the airspeed indicator. Oh, what do those colors mean? Whoa. Oh. Oh, okay. So the white is going to be, well, the lower limit of the white arc is identified as the cutoff bone speed difference in the configuration. Okay. Okay. The white arc indicates full flap operating range of your aircraft. Full flap. So does that mean I can't use flaps if I'm operating at an airspeed a little higher than what's indicated there at the top or the greater number of that white arc? I've got three notches of flaps on my airplane. Is this telling me here right now I can't put flaps in until I'm at 100 knots? No. No, because I can put partial flaps. I could go with 10 degrees higher, 20 degrees higher, but full flaps. So it's important to remember the white arc is the full flap operating range of the airplane. And the bottom, or the lower number of the white arc, is that area. It's the stall speed in the landing configuration. Green. Clean. We know the bottom of the green, that's where, it, with no flaps, that's where I can expect my stall speed to be found. The top of the green indicates the top of my normal operating range. Or we call it VNO, but that's not what we call it. We say VNO, but it actually means what? They call it structural cruising speed. VNO means structural cruising speed, yes. which is stupid, but that's what they call it. It is the normal operating range, but it's, 
VNO means structural cruising. I get it. I get it. I do. It's that tricky thing that they throw out there at you. Then you have the caution range. The yellow indicates the caution range. Penetrate that range in smooth air only. Correct? Okay. Then at the top of that, the red line, that's your never exceed. Never, ever, ever. <clears throat> in the commercial side, we're going to look at this differently. These are the basics. But when you start flying high performance aircraft, you're going to notice that that VNE sign is going to look like a candy cane. And it's going to move around on you a little bit. Because that number, that number gets lower the higher you go. So, and we'll talk about why that is when we get to the commercial side of things. But these are the basics. Okay. <coughs> now, <coughs> I'm not going to put you through this. V speeds. Hun, you got to know them. I do. You got to know what you got to know all your V speeds. I've been I have flashcards and stuff. Like You're the best. You're going to need to know what is the difference between indicated airspeed, true airspeed, calibrated airspeed, and ground speed. Mm -hmm. You've got to know the difference between all four of those. Right? The errors. Know the errors caused by, how long do we go today, Ellie? 11.20. 11.20. 11 oh, okay. Good, good, good. <clears throat> Understand kind of what happens. Understand that if you get an airspeed, if you get a pitot blockage and a static blockage, at whatever altitude that that happens with that, now all of a sudden your altimeter starts acting like an altim um, your airspeed indicator starts acting like an altimeter mm -hmm. with that because it's kind of wherever it is. If it's just the pitot that's going to get blocked, you're going to register zero. But if you get both of them, kind of for whatever reason, if that should happen with that, you've got something that's going to be more like an altimeter than an airspeed indicator. But you've got to know the differences between what happens here and what happens in the event of a blockage. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Good Lord, I almost swallowed my gum. All right, you're going to need to know how an altimeter works. Remember that in a standard atmosphere at sea level, we're looking at 29.92 inches of mercury at 15 degrees Celsius at sea level. That's kind of what we call our standard atmosphere. That's where we start the bar with measuring things about that. The higher that you go, the less dense the atmosphere. So the altimeter is designed to actually take advantage of that change of pressures inside the case of the altimeter itself. <clears throat> So the altimeter is a sealed system sealed to the static system. It gets its information from the static sources, the static vents. So it reads what that pressure is around that airplane at any one time, the static pressure. In order for that to happen, inside that case, you have this thing called an aneroid wafer. It's kind of like an accordion. And what happens is, is that at sea level, with all that pressure, it's relatively flat. As the altitude increases and the pressure around the airplane becomes less dense, it starts to expand because there's less pressure. It's like the old thing you've seen with a balloon. If you take a balloon out here and you blow up a balloon and you take it in your car and here in Aspen and then you drive over Independence Pass and measure the difference between it, you'll see that it's expanded. Why? Less pressure, etc. It can expand. Same thing happens with that altimeter. As your altitude increases and the pressure becomes less, that aneroid wafer expands. As it does, there's a mechanical linkage in that that makes the hands go clockwise, indicating a higher altitude. As you begin to descend and the pressure becomes greater, it starts squeezing against that squeeze box. Hands go counterclockwise, indicating a lower number. Okay, so that's kind of how that works with that aneroid wafer in there. Again, remembering. 
that it's sealed, it's a sealed case here, but exposed to that static source. So it gets that static source, okay? <clears throat> In order for that to give us useful information, we need to know what I need to do with that little knob in there and adjust those numbers in that Colesman window, the Colesman window that we have here. I think you guys can see that here on this thing. So that I can put in a number that gives me useful information as I am flying some altitude above sea level, which we call mean sea level or true altitude. You're going to need to know all the different altitudes as well. So mean sea level. Well, wait a minute, Mr. R, I remember you telling us in my last class that for every thousand feet of elevation of altitude that we gain, we lose approximately one inch of pressure. But they tell me that my altimeter setting here is going to be 29.92, but shouldn't it be 21.92 with all of the 8,000 feet that I've lost? True pressure, that would be correct. But in order for us to get information in that altimeter, we need to know what is it on mean sea level. Well, in order to have that happen, we have to have some device that calculates and recalibrates that number for sea level. So that's why we don't call it a pressure setting on the altimeter. We call it an altimeter setting. Because that number that you're given by ATC or the weather services has been calibrated for sea level, which gives us MSL when we dial in the right altimeter setting into our Colesman window. Good so far. Okay, that's kind of how that puppy works. Oh, look at that, there's the drawings. Okay. When we get above 18,000 feet, one of the things that we do when we get into class alpha airspace, class alpha airspace, 18,000 feet to 60,000 feet, right? Boom, 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 there we go. All kinds of review here, Ellie, my gift to you. One of the things that happens as we pass that 18,000 foot threshold is that we dial our altimeter to 29.92. Why do we do that? In the lower 48, we're not going to hit nothing at 18,000 feet, right? We would in Alaska, though, wouldn't we? Denali. Okay. So here we go to 29.92. Let's think about this. <clears throat> here in the mountains, when you fly from one valley to the next, you could be in a different ecosystem versus any place else out on the plains. And that can happen pretty quickly. The pressure levels can change in a very short distance, meaning that we're constantly, every five to ten minutes, we're constantly picking up the next altimeter setting to kind of stay here within whatever air mass we happen to be flying through, whatever pressure mass we may be flying through, based on what all of these different reporting stations at all of these airports are giving us, as well as ATC can give us. They can give it to us here over our radios, or we can actually dial that in in our G1000 and see what is the weather at this station, or we can tune in on the radio on our alternate frequency to listen to the ATIS of an airport that we're flying over if it's an automated system like an AWOS or an ASOS. So we can get that, so that we know altimeter setting-wise where we are. If we've gone more than 10 minutes of flying and we haven't adjusted our altimeter, we need to be getting a little twitchy you know, out here, because we need to stay on top of that, because it can be dramatic. Above 18,000 feet, normally we're going to be moving pretty fast, right? So if you think about this, if you think about an airplane that's going to be flying at 300 knots, all you would be doing is adjusting your altimeter. Just, you'd just be doing it constantly. So it's not practical, number one, for us to fly like that, moving as quickly as we do. So what we do is, at 18,000 feet here in the lower 48, we all go to 29.92 inches of mercury, and what we do is, we all accept those different changes of altitude based on the pressures that we're, that we're experiencing here, but we're all on the same sheet of music. So if we do have a little variation that causes us to kind of gain or lose things, which is something that you'll see periodically, 
on your altimeter setting at 29.92, you'll notice that your GPS is giving you an altitude saying, hey, wait a minute, this is a little bit different, you know, we're doing this, because that's what's happening. We're all kind of doing this. It's not just that. So that's why we do it, <coughs> okay? Now, you can look at this, you can see these, you're gonna need to know, you know, what, is, what do all those little numbers mean and all of that stuff. How to check your altimeter accuracy on the ground, you wanna make sure that it's within 75 feet plus or minus of, the, uh, of what's reported. I want you to take a look. Figure 10-17, says that right there, right there, Ellie, it says it. Always update your altimeter setting. What is the penalty for failing to update your altimeter setting, especially on a long flight. You don't realize that your altitude is changing when you go down and down and down when you run into a mountain. So, high to low, look out below. If you do not keep up with your altimeter setting changes, flying from an area of high pressure to low pressure, you will actually be lower than your indicated altitude high to low, look out below. Your actual altitude will be lower than indicated. That is a huge problem when you're flying up here into the rocks. Okay, high to low, look out below. Conversely, low to high, clear the sky. Low to high, clear the sky your actual altitude will be higher than indicated, provided that you are not staying up on your altimeter changes. They call this, they call this an altimeter error. Is it really an altimeter error? No. What is it? It's a pilot error. That's what it is. Super pilot out there is not fixing stuff. So that's, that's one of the things. That's why we have to stay on top of those altimeter changes. Same thing with temperature. Same thing with temperature. It, it, it operates the exact same way. So, got to keep those things in mind. You're going to get several questions on that as, as well. Oh, look at that. From high to low, look out below. Altimeter errors. Pfft, please. Okay, you can look at that. Temperature error. You can review all of this. Oh, look, this is just what we talked about. Huh. Okay. Know these altitudes. You're going to have to know them all. Okay? Now, vertical speed indicator. What's the difference between vertical speed indicator and an altimeter? The big difference. The big difference? This provides a direct readout of the rate of change of altitude as opposed to this shows. If I look at the case inside this vertical speed indicator, I've got an aneroid wafer in there too. Mm -hmm. Huh, well that works. But what separates this instrument from an altimeter? It doesn't show, like, the purpose is different. Okay, <laughs> the purpose of course is different. Hang on. Look right here. So what happens in this case is that you have this little valve, this little what they call here a metering valve, or it's a little hole in that case that provides a calibrated leak. And what it does is that it provides a delay in that reporting system that as you begin a change of flight from level to either a climb or a descent, you still get that change of pressure that will indicate that you're climbing with, with you know, less pressure, thing expands, number gets bigger, that goes above the zero line. But as you, as you stabilize that climb, it'll hold that as opposed to keep going like an altimeter is. And the reason that it'll stay there is because of that calibrated leak 
in that system. That delay offers you valuable information as regard to your rate of climb or descent. So it gives you rate of descent or climb information. 500 feet per minute, 1,000 feet per minute, 1,500 feet per minute. That's what you're after. In VFR flying, we normally look at that VSI just to show that we have a positive rate of climb and then from there we just kind of, well, I just want the best I can get. In the instrument world, remember, it's a little bit different because we have to be in a situation where we have to be able to climb at 500 feet per minute or we have to let ATC know. So, the, so that becomes a little bit more of a useful instrument to us. Then on descents, we normally plan on a 500 foot per minute descent. Well, as we look at this and we start doing our math, this is where again, this machine, this little device, this little gauge, gives us more useful information in the instrument world than normally the way that we use it in the VFR world. So, <clears throat> there's that. Gyros. The primary operating principle of a gyro is that you have to have this inertial disk that's spinning. Once you get that disk spooled up, <clears throat> It needs to, tr to want to stay where it is. By putting that disc in this, this, this cage, we call it a gimbal, that will allow movement all around that disc. <clears throat> what it does is that it allows that disc to stay here, but we read that resistance toward that spinning disc in the form of the old style gauges a needle that might move one direction or another, or a heading that may change one way or another, or showing a bank or a pitch one way or another. We're basically looking at the relative movement of the airplane around the disk. The basic operating principle we call rigidity in space. This object's desire to stay spinning on that one plane gives us useful information as we turn the airplane around it. That's kind of how this works. To keep that disc spinning, the old ways were kind of the, the old vacuum pumps that would blow air over the little gyro buckets, they used to call them, you know with that? The little veins on the signs. Now they can be done electronically with those, so that, um, you know, electrically, um, to be able to, to keep those discs running. So that's kind of how those work. The old style planes, we used to have a suction meter right here. And you would want to keep that suction meter in the green. <clears throat> used to be on my takeoff roll callouts, I would have to say, airspeed alive, engines in the green, suction in the green. I would have to look at those to make sure that all of those things were going on my takeoff roll before I would rotate and fly. Now I don't necessarily look at the vacuum pump on these things. I don't have that as a call out anymore, but you know, there you go, back in the day. One of the things in the, the gyros is this. The biggest things happening in these would be some form of a power failure or losing your vacuum pump. The problem with the old analog gauges like this is that you get that spinning disc spinning the vacuum pump normally doesn't just completely fail all at once. All of a sudden, it, that vacuum pump may start to lose some of its efficiency, and over time, that disc starts to spin down. When that disc starts to spin down, let's say that it's, a, it's an instrument that, that may have that disc in a vertical axis, it may start to, over time, slightly wobble off a bit. Well, if this is your attitude indicator, it may show on your attitude indicator, it's like, oh my gosh, it's showing me here, that I'm, I've got a, a, you know, a left bank. I'm gonna straighten it up. And then you straighten up your, 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 uh, your, your wings based on what the attitude indicator is telling you. Then it keeps wobbling off. Oh my gosh, it's still showing that. You correct it. But what happens is, is that you're correcting it in the wrong direction. And what you're doing is you're basically turning yourself into controlled flight into terrain because you're following an instrument that is no longer working. 
So you have to look at your other supporting instruments to say, am I really banked? Am I really banked? Is my turn coordinator banked? Is my, is my heading changing? Well, if my heading is changing with this, something else is wrong. I'm in a turn. How do I fix it? If my airspeed indicator all of a sudden now is showing that I am that I'm picking up speed, if my altimeter is showing that I'm losing altitude, hold on here, folks. Wait a second. Something's wrong. My attitude indicator isn't working. Mm -hmm. And we used to carry these little rubber three-inch little discs that you could pull out of your flight bag and pop it right on your attitude indicator so that you wouldn't look at it anymore. So that's the way we used to do it. Now with the G1000s, you get a big red X. If anything happens to that, instantly you get a red X. And when you're in the clouds and that happens, it's pretty high on the pucker factor. So there you go. Turn coordinator. How you doing? Are we doing okay? Yeah. We're doing all right? Okay. Turn coordinator or your turn indicator. We get two types of information from this. Number one, we can talk about, well, actually three different types of information on the turn coordinator. As we look at the turn coordinator, we can kind of tell based on the little tick marks at the 90 degree sides of these that our wings are level, okay? Below that, we also have something called an inclinometer. So we get not just our, our wings level here at the horizontal, but is my tail behind the nose? Am I yawing in one direction or another? If the ball slides out to the left, we know that we need left rudder, so we step on the ball. If the ball rolls out to the right, you know that we need right rudder. We need to pull that nose back around to the right. We step on the right rudder to push the ball around to get it back centered so that we're in coordinated flight. We keep that ball between the two little lines there. Now below that ball, we see something that says two minutes. What is the functionality of that two minute thing? What does that mean? <coughs> Let's take a look at this. So here we are where our wings are level. But Ellie, I'm looking down here and I see these tick marks down here. What are those for? I'll give you a hint. It has something to do with that. By the way, I'm drawing left-handed. I'm not kidding. <laughs> if you bank your aircraft and you put your right wing on that tick mark, and you're turning to the right, keeping the ball centered, you are going to be making a standard rate turn. A standard rate turn turns your aircraft three degrees per second, meaning standard rate, you can turn 360 degrees in two minutes. That is standard rate. <coughs> <coughs> standard rate comes up occasionally in VFR, comes up all the time in instrument world. ATC expects you in the instrument world to make standard rate turns. They know that to turn 180 degrees is going to take you a minute. They know if they give you a vector that's going to turn you 45 degrees, you're going to do it in 30 seconds. So the way that that works is <coughs> your turn coordinator can also help you make standard rate turns. Now, let's say, for instance, you get a call out from ATC and they want you to make a turn at half standard rate. How long would it take you, how long would it take you to go 360 degrees? Four minutes. Okay? Here's an example of how that would work. Let me, let me go back to this again. So the, the, the tick marks, the lower tick marks here beyond the horizontal are going to indicate, in, indicate standard rate. If you need half standard rate, you're going to kind of put them right there in the middle. Okay, That's going to be half standard rate or a four minute 360 degree turn. So where this comes into play is this. <clears throat> you're in the traffic pattern. Tower calls you and they says, 141 Hotel Lima, I need you to give me a right 
360 degree turn for spacing. Terrain permitting, traffic permitting, you look at this and you say 141 Hotel Lima turning right, standard rate, 360 degrees. They just bought two minutes. Okay? In some cases, if they have an instrument traffic coming in here on a, on a long final like this and they need to come in here and land, they just bought two minutes. If they say, give me a half standard rate turn, they bought four minutes. Mm -hmm. Okay? So that's kind of how that works. When you're in instrument conditions, you are always expected to turn no more than standard rate. You always want to keep your turns in the clouds standard rate. Anything more aggressive than that is going to require more of your attention. And in the clouds, you need to have your attention on the task at hand, not just the turn. Okay? Because a lot of times these turns are not just turns. There'll be a descending turn. There'll be a climbing turn. There'll be a descending turn to a hard deck, a, a, a floor that you cannot go below. So it's not just that standard rate turn that you're making, but it's also intercepting and not going below that particular altitude. So you kind of got a lot of things going on. Getting used to making standard rate turns is what you're after. That's what that turn coordinator can do for us, more so than just our bank angle or our yaw. And again, it shows the gimbal presentation there as well. You can look at that. Attitude indicator. <coughs> we refer to the attitude indicator as the alpha and the omega. When we are doing our instrument scan, we begin with the attitude indicator, we end with the attitude indicator. That's how we make our scan. <coughs> uh, what was I doing here? I want this. Because I want to show this also here. The reason that we have a scan on instruments is because we have two things that we need to guard against. One is omission, the other is fixation. So we never just want to just look at one instrument. <clears throat> but by the same token, we don't want to just look at three instruments and forget the others. We constantly have to do this. So if you think about what an aircraft panel looks like, the traditional six-pack, there's a reason that the attitude, <coughs> pardon me, there's a reason that the attitude indicator is in the center of the top row. It's, that's the primary position. So when you're looking at the attitude indicator, you can begin with, with a scan that kind of looks maybe like this. Attitude indicator, heading indicator. Attitude indicator, airspeed indicator. Attitude indicator, altimeter. Attitude indicator, vertical speed indicator. Attitude indicator, turn coordinator. Attitude indicator, heading indicator. A and you just keep that scan going. You're doing a lot of stuff. So in the traditional six pack where you have all these instruments, you're, you're kind of, you know, you're looking around a lot. Why is it then, when we look at a G1000, why do you suppose that the entire surface area of the primary flight display is an attitude indicator? Because it's the way it should be. Everything has to do with the beginning and the end of that attitude indicator. And the beautiful part about the G1000 is that you have everything there as you need it. But it still doesn't prevent you, or doesn't, it should not prevent you from making that same scan. You still need to, attitude indicator, heading indicator, attitude, airspeed, attitude, altitude, attitude, vertical speed, attitude, turn coordinator, because your turn coordinator is up here with this, right? Okay, so that is the biggie with that attitude indicator. It is everything. The attitude indicator gives us bank information here. 
it also gives us a pitch ladder. So it gives us pitch, so a positive or a climbing pitch here. And then here's our horizontal. So this is our horizontal um, horizon, the artificial horizon here, I should say. The little, the little yellow bars are our wings. The nose of the airplane is the tip of the triangle, okay? If we're down here uh, in the ground stuff, we're descending. If we're up here, we should be climbing. Depends on our power settings, of course, but that's kind of the way that these things work. So you have all of this information right here with just a very logical presentation for everything that we do. Questions on that? Okay, okay. So with this, now we get to our heading indicator. Heading indicator, again, is one of our gyroscopic instruments. We look at that as an HI heading indicator as well. In the heading indicator, <coughs> the heading indicator is not necessarily the same thing as a, as a magnetic compass or, a, or like that wet compass. And again, Ellie, keep track of the time here and don't let me babble on because you know how I get. <coughs> so the heading indicator here, the old-timey heading indicators, every, every 10 to 15 minutes had to be readjusted to match your compass. Because even though it was, it was like a gyroscopic instrument there, the thing that it wouldn't do is change based on the degrees of the magnetic flux mm -hmm. of the Earth. So you periodically had to make your compass adjustment on your heading indicator. And you would do that here with this little, uh, this little knob that would allow you to then make your heading indicator match your compass reading, the wet compass in your airplane. Mm -hmm. So that's what you used to have to do. Now with these, we no longer have to do that. They do it for us. Oh my gosh, flying now is so easy. It's almost like cheating, <laughs> but I'll take it because I think it's a lot safer. So every 10 or 15 minutes in straight and level flight is when we would adjust that heading indicator. And the heading indicator, of course, what it does is it gives us a heading, one of 360 options for us to fly. Now, one of the things that makes this a little bit of a challenge is that if you look here at this, this presentation that we have here on the heading indicator, you can see, okay, now wait a minute. If I, if I really look hard at these tick marks, I can see that I have great big tick marks every 30 degrees. I have kind of intermediate tick marks every 10 degrees. And then I have five degree increments in between. And then between that, I don't have like a whole lot. So how difficult do you think it is to actually try to fly a heading of 262 degrees. <laughs> You're kind of guessing. You sort of are. And you sort of put it between 260 and 265 and kind of hope for the best. That's what you do. Let's take a look at this. With this, we can enter in into our heading setting with our little heading knob right there. We can actually plug in 262. And it gives us a little heading bug right here. And all we do to fly 262 is we put the little triangle thingy into the little triangle receptacle. And as long as we have these two things right there in the notch, we're flying 262. Go us. And we don't have a little knob that we have to adjust this every 10 or 15 minutes to kind of, take to, to kind of adjust for the magnetic flux or the, the lines of magnetic variation that we have in the Earth. It does it for us. So that gives us our heading. Woohoo! Go us. Now this is a heading indicator, but what you're looking at here on this is actually not what we call a heading indicator. We call this a horizontal situation indicator because on top of our heading we also have a form of navigational guidance. So anytime that you have a heading indicator that also has some mode of navigational guidance, now it becomes a horizontal situation indicator or an HSI versus an HI for heading indicator, HI, versus horizontal situation indicator, HSI. The G1000 includes an HSI. So with this, we can get GPS signal or 
I can go through here. I can get VOR signal here for my first VOR. I actually have two VORs on here, so I can get a second VOR signal. So I have three different modes of navigational information that I can call on here for my HSI. Okay. So, talk about the magnetic lining, we talk about the inclinometer, we talked about turns and banks, standard rate turns, magnetic compass. All right, we've got 11 minutes, right? Mm -hmm. 11 minutes. Explain to me, Ellie, <coughs> because I've talked far too long, how does a compass work? A mag uh, I'm sorry, a, a wet magnetic compass. Okay. Hold on. Hold on. You said the T word. <laughs> okay, we have two poles. Go ahead. North and south. Yes. Okay. And they're aligned with magnetic force, and these compasses, the wet magnetic compass, allows the arrow to spin around to find north. So if you like turn south, the arrow's gonna turn towards you because north is that way. Okay. So that way you, you can kind of align yourself with it always towards north. Okay. Which north? Magnetic. Magnetic north. Not true north. Not true north. No. True north, as you'll recall is geographic north. Yes. That's where we use lines of longitude and latitude, and our GPS information makes a lot more sense like that. But for a magnetic compass to work, it will only point to true north if it's working properly. And we know that true north and magnetic, I'm sorry, we, I'm sorry, God, I said that wrong, magnetic north, my God in heaven. The magnetic compass will only port, point to magnetic north. <sighs> so, we know that magnetic north and true north are not co-located. True north is going to be, if you follow a line of longitude to, to the terminus, it will be at the North Pole, geographic or true north. But magnetic north is not anywhere close. In fact, magnetic north is over some lake in western Canada moving toward Russia at about 33 miles a year. That's what it's doing right now, so it wanders a bit. As it wanders, so do the lines of magnetic flux around the Earth. The magnetic field around the Earth, because of the fact that we have a molten core, a molten iron core of our planet, that's what creates that magnetic field, which, by the way, is what allows us to have an atmosphere here in our planet. So, you know, go molten iron, okay? Let's keep that going. <coughs> So those lines of magnetic flux, they move around. The magnetic compass will read those lines, will read the, well, well the, I'm sorry, the magnetic compass will point toward true north. And what we have to do is that we have to make some sort of a change in our navigation based on where we are and where that magnetic variation occurs. Some of the magnetic variation as we move from, from east to west or west to east, we have to, to actually compensate for that to get our magnetic course from a true course. These lines are called lines of magnetic variation. And on our sectional maps, they're every five degrees or every half degree. They'll show what that magnetic variation is. So, <clears throat> we have one agonic line that kind of runs through basically from just west of New Orleans on up to magnetic north. And then everything else that goes from there, either west or east, is going to be some form of a magnetic variation, which is going to be those lines of flux that we measure by degree. Here in Aspen, we're about in that 10 degree east range. 
And that's kind of moving because it's all kind of moving west here as magnetic north moves around. It's one of the reasons why we have to get new sectional maps every six months because that line of magnetic variation changes. So we have to get our course, true course first, make our magnetic variation adjustment to get our magnetic course because we need to break everything down to a magnetic course because if all that stuff turns off, at least we have our compass. At least we have that. And we're still using magnetic field for navigation. All of the VORs are all set up magnetically. But the only thing that isn't is GPS. Because GPS relies on true north. And it's much more stable. It doesn't move around, at least not that I'm aware of. <coughs> and we have these satellites circling our Earth to help make that signal far more accurate than any type of a reading and adjustment and all that stuff that we do here magnetically. Ultimately, everything is going to go the way of GPS. But while we still have active VOR receivers or, or transmitters that we have, uh, stations on the ground, they are always going to be adjusted for the magnetic variation and that's what defines our, our Victor Airways. That's what we're going to use for both in, uh, VFR and instrument flight. So we always need to know how do we make these magnetic course adjustments, not just so that I know what altitude I need to select, but how I can keep from hitting somebody or something as I'm tra traversing along these Victor Airways. So even though it may seem like this arcane navigational aid that we have, Everything that we use here still works off that magnetic principle. Okay. okay. So, the big things here with this, <clears throat> understanding how all of this works, understanding magnetic variation, are going to be Understanding these magnetic lines of variation, <clears throat> understanding how we use those for, for adjusting our magnetic course, knowing what magnetic deviation is. Magnetic deviation is that thing that occurs in the cockpit based on the magnetic interference of the instruments within that particular aircraft. The magnetic de uh, variation happens on the map with the lines of flux. We also have Errors, magnetic dip and compass errors. Remember the acronym ANS, accelerate north, decelerate south. When you are on an easterly or westerly heading and you accelerate or decelerate your plane, your compass is going to show a turn momentarily. If you accelerate, it's going to turn toward the north. Don't follow it. Don't, don't follow that if you're accelerating. If you decelerate, it's going to show a turn to the south. Don't chase it, okay? That's just kind of what happens. Acceleration, deceleration on an easterly or westerly heading, that's what's going to happen. ANDS, A-N-D-S, accelerate north, decelerate south. Then the turning error, because that has to do with dip. The turning error, we use the acronym UNOS. If you are on a north or south heading and you turn away from that north or south heading, on a northerly heading, if you turn away from it, your compass is going to want to stay behind. It's run home to mama. It's pointing north and it likes it. It wants to stay. So it's going to lag behind your turn away from that course. So it will undershoot that turn to the north. If you're heading south, you're going the opposite direction. And now you begin to turn away from it. And remember, that compass wants to run home to mama. So it is going to swing around faster than your turn. So it will lead your turn. It will lag from the north. It will lead from the south. Undershoot north, overshoot south. UNOS. That is your turning errors based on a northerly or southerly heading. Those are the two biggies. How are we doing? Doing okay? Yeah. All right. <clears throat> So we have gotten through instruments here, young lady. So now, what was it we said we were going to do? Calculus. We're going to do 
balance. Correct. So on Friday, we're going to knock out weight and balance, and it'll be a review on weight and balance. Should I yep. Okay, cool. We're going to do we're going to do it on weight and balance, but what we're going to do is we're going to do it on the stuff for your test. I'm not going to pull the weight and balance stuff for the DA40s. We're going to do it here. So I believe in big blue, take a look at chapter 8. Okay. Chapter 8 in big blue, I think the first part of that is weight and balance. So we're going to do the review on weight and balance on Friday. Then, another quiz. Yeah, that's it. And after you finish this review, then go on to take your test. So after we finish the pilot review test, come in at the time of screening and take two practice tests. On the private pilot? Yeah. Yeah, when we're done with all the private yeah. pilot yeah. stuff. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And then, and then my dad wants to take me back in conjunction. So of course. I need somebody to like, endorse that and then I'll go down. Done. He'll take me. Okay. As soon as and we're done with the then, private. And then when we're done with the instrument, I'm going to do the same thing. That's, that's exactly what we, we talked about that first day. That's exactly what we're going to do until you tell me something different. Great. And then the commercial, so my final for this class, the commercial uh, was a commercial Are you going to, like, am I going to 